Our second reading recorded in Philippians chapter one is the text for Vicar's message here in a moment. Listen carefully. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Having had a year to hear me, I asked Pastor Arp this Sunday, I said, what's it been like hearing me preach all these weeks this year? And he said, well, it's a lot like riding the bull at the rodeo. I said, how's that? And he said, well, I clench my teeth really hard, and I hold on tight to my seat, and I try to make it through at least eight seconds. (laughs) The theme for today's sermon is joyful suffering, and you have a wonderful example in front of you in this moment. Joyful suffering. So when when I sat down this week to think about my experience uh, with joyful suffering, I was actually reminded of a quote from a character named Ron Weasley in the Harry Potter series. Now, probably most of you are familiar with Harry Potter and the books and the movies that followed, um, but if you're not, go ahead and watch them. I won't spoil it for you. But Ron is Harry's best friend, and they do everything together, and they go through magic school together to learn how to be wizards. And one of the things that they do in magic school is that they have to learn to read tea leaves to predict each other's futures. It's one of the things they can do as wizards. And so Ron and Harry are partners, and Ron picks up the cup that Harry's drinking from, and he says this, well, Harry's got a bit of a wonky cross, and that represents trials and suffering. But this here, this could be the sun, and that represents happiness. So you're going to suffer, but you're going to be happy about it. And then everyone looks at Ron like he's the biggest fool in the entire world, because we all know that suffering and happiness don't go together. They can't both be true at the same time. And in some ways, they're correct. Happiness and suffering do not go together. That would be an inauthentic way of expressing one's emotions over the circumstances of their life. However, joy and suffering absolutely do go together. In fact, joy was really built for the purpose of suffering. Because joy is a description of what we are living in and have to look forward to as Christians. Joy is the certain knowledge that despite the trials and the suffering of this world, that we have entered into a perfect eternal life with our blessed Creator and Redeemer on the day that we were baptized. 
Now, Paul lets us in on the distinction between joy and happiness very early in our reading for today. In fact, in the first line in verse 19, he says, yes, and I will rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Now, not one line earlier, he's talking about being imprisoned for the sake of the gospel, thrown in jail, not to mention the fact that Paul's had a number of other bad things happen to him. He's been beaten with rods, jailed, stoned, dragged into court repeatedly, shipwrecked, bitten by snakes, shunned by people that he thought were his friends and abandoned, and he's had many, many other things happen to him as well in pursuit of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul at no point says, oh man, I was so happy to be beaten and jailed for Jesus, right? He didn't post on Instagram saying, hashtag jailed for Jesus, look at me, right? This wasn't a good thing that he was happy about. He never wrote to the Philippians saying, man, it really made my day when those snakes bit me because I knew I was doing it for the gospel. What a happy occasion, right? No, he, he doesn't say that at all. He says that he rejoices. He rejoices. He has joy, which is something altogether different because Paul has the joy of the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And he knows that he can overcome all of the suffering and trials that this world presents to us because Jesus Christ did it first. Through Christ's victory over sin, death, and the devil, Paul tells us that we have entered into that victory as well. However, this doesn't mean that Paul didn't still deal with horrible things, frustrations, suffering, sadness. In verses 22 and 23, he says that to die would be gain for him. Can you imagine that? To die would be gain for him. He wishes to depart the suffering of this world and to go be with Jesus. The truly horrible things that he was put through led him to want to die. That is true sorrow. And that's being authentic to your feelings. He doesn't pull any punches. And that's a good thing. Because life in general is hard. But life as a Christian is altogether harder. Because Satan is coming for you with much more focus. However, Paul's joy comes through again when he says that there is still so much more fruitful labor that the Lord has set before him to fulfill. He needs to spread the gospel to so many more people, and so to live is also a terrific thing in God's kingdom. In verse 25, he even says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul knows that his joy isn't something he's supposed to keep to himself. It's something that he's supposed to share with the entire world. It's his weapon for overcoming the suffering that we face, his reveling in Christ's glorious victory, which he goes on to talk about in verse 26. He tells the Philippians that when they see him coming, Paul that is, that they will have ample reason to glory in Christ, that they'll see Paul's joy, a joy that knows about a risen Savior who's overcome all the tragedy of this world, and they themselves will then be filled with joy. Now, in verse 27, he kind of flips the script on him, and he turns the tables on the Philippians, and he tells them, you need to do the same thing for me. I need to see your joy also because I am also a human being who suffers many trials. He tells them to live a life in a manner worthy of the gospel. And by living in God's commands and by trusting God's promises and by living in His will for creation, they're actually sharing their joy back with Paul and with anybody else that they come into contact with. This joy points others to a risen Savior and to a perfect eternal life with Him. And in verse 28, he goes on to tell the Philippians that their joy is actually a weapon that they can use against the devil and all of his forces of evil that he tries to wield against your brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, your joy and certainty of our Christ's resurrection and a perfect eternal life that he has promised us is, quote, a certain sign of the devil's destruction. 
That's Paul's own words. Every time you so, show joy in the face of suffering, you are declaring to the world that the devil has been bound forever and he can never escape. He is defeated for all time. And that is powerful. Your joy will lead you to salvation and deliverance by our Lord. Now, in verses 29 and 30, Paul gives a warning to anybody who has Christian joy. He tells the Philippians, make no mistake, sin, death, and the devil are coming for you with everything that they have. You're absolutely going to face trials in this world. It isn't just a possibility, it's a guarantee. It's going to be difficult. It's not easy to wake up every day and choose joy. It's not something you just roll out of bed and naturally do. You might become weary, you might become dismayed, and you might even lose your joy for a while. In fact, Paul says he struggles with these same things in verse 30. But here's the mystery, guys. God is always in the midst of our suffering. He's never the cause of it. No human beings did suffering all on their own. But amazingly, dumbfoundingly, and even almost unbelievably, God actually works through the suffering of His Son, Jesus, to overcome suffering for all time. We'll come to that in a second. Now, what Paul told the Philippians nearly 2,000 years ago still holds true today. Everything that I've seen from you has pointed me to a risen Savior, St. Luke's. Even though I know you faced many sufferings, I've had many friends this year on the homebound list who have departed this life. I've heard stories of past abuse, of unfaithful spouses, of the too early loss of a child. I've heard of friends that have gotten diagnosed with diseases, diseases that they fear for their life with. I've seen families broken. I've seen addictions ravage people's bodies. And now, finally, dear brothers and sisters at St. Luke's, I'm on the precipice of leaving you. Perhaps for some, for only a short time, but for others, this might be the last time you and I see each other face to face on this side of eternity. Sin has ruined our relationship with each other. Sin has ruined our relationship with God our Father, and the devil is trying with everything that he can to rip us away from our Lord and Savior. But I have also seen your joy overcome all of the trials that you have faced this year. Every time that one of my friends that I would visit on the homebound list passed away, I'd attend their funeral and hear a sermon preached about the blessed assurance that they had that Jesus was coming back and would raise them from the dead, their joy of a risen Savior. For all the stories of past abuse and unfaithfulness, I heard about the restoration that Jesus Christ was bringing in a way that only He could. For all the times that someone shared with me that they lost a child far too early in life, I heard them eagerly looking forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come where they will see their child once again. For all my friends that were diagnosed with illnesses, I have seen a witness of the joy that we have in a risen Savior who defeated death first and who is in control of all things, a sovereign God who will care for all of their needs and even the needs of those that they love and are afraid of leaving behind. For all the families that have been broken, I've heard of your hope that God will tear down the walls that we as humans build up between one another. And for all those who have suffered through addiction, I have heard how Jesus has used your suffering to turn you into a new person, to create in you a new heart, one that loves to serve God and to serve others instead of their own fleshly desires. Just as Paul told the Philippians in verse 27, to live a life in a manner worthy of the gospel, St. Luke's Lutheran Church, I have seen you do the same. I have seen you stand firm in one spirit. 
I have seen you with one mind striving side by side in pursuit of the gospel. And I have seen your joy overcome the trials that you face every day. And I want to encourage you to continue in this work. Just like we talked about last week, pray for each other. Pray for specific needs that you know people have. Pray generally for all of your brothers and sisters here, those that you see and those that you do not see. Encourage one another in the joy that we have, that Jesus rose from the dead and is coming back again, and that he defeated all of the tragedy of this world. Paul talks about this in verse 19. And as we encourage one another... We look to the one who showed true joy in the face of suffering, Jesus Christ. But before I get to that, I want to return back to the quote that I talked to you about at the beginning of the sermon from Ron Weasley. The original quote was this, The cross represents suffering, but the sun, S-U-N, represents happiness. I want to amend that statement. I want to change it to this. The cross represents suffering, but the sun represents S-O-N is our joy. As Christ endured the agony and suffering of the cross, He knew that He was fulfilling His Father's perfect will for creation. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. Imagine that. The joy set before Jesus, He endured the cross. Christ's joy is you and me and all of creation restored to its full greatness and beauty forever and ever. And he accomplished that through his death and resurrection. Jesus also knew that Easter was only three days away. Now, Jesus was not happy to be dying, make no mistake. He moaned in agony. He suffered mightily. He asked his father why he had been abandoned to die alone on the cross. While he was on the cross, he showed that he had a joy that overcame his own suffering and crucifixion. Because the very people that put him up there to murder him and were ridiculing him, he asked his father to forgive. The man that was next to him, a thief on the cross, he pointed him towards that perfect eternal life that we are waiting He says, today you will be with me in paradise. And then three days later, he rose from the dead to complete our joy and the joy of the entire world. Christ has been raised from the dead and death is defeated for all time. So even when the worst suffering of this world comes along and we have all died long ago and returned to dust in a coffin in the ground in a grave that no one remembers and no one visits, Christ will raise us back up into a perfect eternity forever and ever. So just as Paul says in verse 20, Christ will be honored by our bodies, whether in life or in death, because Jesus is the almighty King forever. Amen. All right, now we got some emotional stuff to do. I, uh, I have to say my goodbye to you guys. I, I cried pretty hard at 8 a.m., and I'm going to try not to here at 11.30. I did better at 9.30. Um, I'll start off with a joke. That, that seemed to work last time. This comes from uh, Roy Mack, who's uh, a member of the Haven. Uh, he's a longtime pastor. And so one time Roy had preached a sermon, and a little old lady came up to him after the service and said, that was a great sermon, Pastor Mack. What a wonderful job you did. And trying to be humble, Pastor Mack said, well, it was all the Holy Spirit. And she said, it wasn't that good. <laughs> All right, here we go. Hopefully that tides me through. I want to thank you guys for the way that you adopted Alyssa and I into your family. You shared your joys with us. You shared your woes with us. You shared your suffering. You, you asked us into your homes for meals, and you really treated us like we were part of your family, and I, I can't thank you enough for that. You made our joy complete, and you showed us every day through your words and your actions who the risen Savior is. You have been wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to us, and I can't thank you enough. 
You know, I was cleaning out my desk this week, and in the drawer to my right, I would keep all of the notes and the, the handwritten kind words that you guys have uh, sent to me. And um, I had to clean out my desk this week, and so I picked all of them up at one time, and I couldn't believe the sheer weight and magnitude of all of the cards that you guys had sent. I mean, it must have been a couple pounds of paper. And it reminded me of the love that you have all poured into us and the kindnesses that you have shown us. And I thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. You blessed us well beyond what we deserve. Well, well beyond what I deserve. My wife deserves all of that. But, but you were kind, very kind to us, and I thank you. As we prepare to, to take this holy meal together, um, we proclaim Christ's death and his resurrection until he comes again. And this meal unites us. And so even though this might be the last time that I take this meal with you, physically present amongst you, every time that you eat Christ's body and drink Christ's blood, we are all united together taking that meal. You and I, even though we might be hundreds or thousands of miles apart, are one body taking that meal together. And you're also taking it with all the saints who have gone before us into blessed eternal life. And so I want to Appropriate the words that Ruth says to Naomi in Ruth chapter 1 to you, dear friends. Where you go, dear friends at St. Luke's, so I will be there with you. Where you lodge, there I will reside alongside you. When you face suffering and die, so I will be there suffering with you. But most importantly, and finally, where you reside eternally in a perfect eternal life, there I will be with you. Because your God is my God, and you people have become my people. I'm I'm almost there. I'm not going to cry. Um, I'll leave you with the words that I finish every hospice visit with, and it's this. If you see Jesus before I do, tell him I said hi. All righty. We got a weekly awakening question for you. How do you remember the joy set before you in the midst of your suffering? How do you remember the joy set before you in the midst of your suffering?